All right. Good morning. Welcome to Fred Buzz the Podcast. My name is Joe McMurray. And I'm Aaron Sefchik. And today we have a very special guest, um, a guy who lives in Virginia Beach uh, near where I am. And Mr. Dustin Furlow is an incredible fingerstyle guitarist. And uh, welcome, Dustin. Thanks for the warm welcome, man. It's a pleasure to be talking to you guys this morning. Awesome. Yeah, we're, uh, we're glad to have you. I've been particularly interested in fingerstyle guitar recently. It's uh, struck a chord with me and it was fun. I got to come see you. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I got to come see you about a, was it a month ago? Yeah, and I've been, Yeah, and I've been excited. I've been playing a lot more fingerstyle, so I'm glad to have you on to dig into your style and your approach and yeah, man. all Thank the you. things. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I remember seeing you do uh, Angelina from Tommy Manuel. Yeah, I posted that on, um, on uh, Instagram a while back. Yeah, yeah, it's a good tune. It's got a nice melody to it. Yeah, he he's a great Tommy Emanuel. I mean, he's a great place to start, I guess. But uh, yeah, yeah. he's mm-hmm. a great songwriter. Mm-hmm. I was gonna say it's gonna be impossible to do this podcast without bringing up him. Probably Andy McKee, Michael mm-hmm. Hedden. Right, right. Yeah, and they're fairly recent. They're they're like within the past 10, 15 years. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. And Tommy, he's he's been touring. Uh, well, conversation with a couple people he's he's been touring almost his whole life because you know, yeah. his family for his younger years and you know he's in his 50s now and he's still doing it like it's like breathing he's he's yeah. incredible performer. yeah he's a, he's a beast he's he's been doing it for a long time but mm-hmm. i just saw a recent video of his is just like holy cow this man is just on fire <laughs> yeah it's like breathing for him you know yeah mm-hmm. it really is yeah he's got kind of the for me it's the combination of his songwriting abilities his actual technical abilities on the guitar and his stage presence like yeah. just make him a very very he's a pleasure to watch and to yeah. listen to yeah definitely yep yeah man I've, I've actually met him i met him a long time ago at the Birchmere, like four years ago and okay. this is back when it was easy to, to meet him now he's he's got a big enough following that i think you actually might even have to pay to do a meet and greet now but um really nice guy i, I gave him a cd I, I wrote him a tune called the traveler and i wanted him to oh. hear it um he was like well if you don't hear from me then uh well, how did he say it? he was like he was like i'll let you know if it sucks so if you don't hear from me that's a good thing or something like that <laughs> i assume you didn't hear from him then yeah yeah <laughs> that's funny. but uh, that seems like something he'd say yeah, he, he's very quick-witted, you know, for sure. Um, he's he's on a different frequency than most human beings. Yeah. Yeah, but um, really nice guy. Yeah, and his concerts are always um, worth checking out every now and then. Uh, every couple of years, I always try to make it a point to see where the standard should be, you know, <laughs> where mm-hmm. the bar Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I felt like, for me, Tommy Emanuel is a... I mean, it was kind of maybe not the best place to start, but, you know, a lot of the, even when you look at like his uh, finger style courses on uh, with True Fire and there's a lot of stuff out there, the stuff that he starts with has that kind of old timey feel. It's mm-hmm. a lot of the kind of like open C and G chords, yeah, um, which is fine, but it's not like the stuff that gets me as excited as hearing something like Angelina or Mombasa or... Yeah, like he's got all these cool tunes. So I kind of, I just had to learn Angelina, and it was it kind of kicked my butt for a while. And <laughs> yeah, the timing is very, um, it's it's pretty ahead of the beat sometimes, which is really cool. I, actually, you mm-hmm. know, um, a sort of a side note. Um, about three weeks ago, I was recording with Kim Person, who is um, basically the lady that um, recorded most of his well-known albums. Um, mm-hmm. She's a really nice lady in Yorktown who owns a studio called Cimarron Studio and um, she's recorded Stephen Bennett who's sort of the the godfather of the harp guitar um, uh-huh. and she recorded all of his albums and all of Tommy's early albums in fact Stephen introduced her to Tommy when he first came here to the states and Tommy was like Stephen I want your sound and he's like all right uh, you shall have it <laughs> you know <laughs> so, uh, and she's she was awesome to work with the point I'm gonna make is that um, I was asking her I was like you know recording fingerstyle guitar is very much a raw thing like you really it's really like 
hit the record button and go. And so I was asking her, you know, how do, uh, you know, the pros go about doing it? You know, do they just keep playing until they mess up and then they say, okay, I'm going to punch in here. Or I'm going to do this. or I'm going to do that. I'm going to record this section. Or I'm going to record that section. Um, but apparently what Tommy would do is she, she was like, honestly, his timing is just, it's sickening. <laughs> I was just like, cause he's, he did drums too. You know, he's, he, he, he always likes to say he's equal part drummer and guitarist. And, um, she was basically just like, I barely ever had to punch him in or do any sort of editing. He would come in, bam, bam, bam. Like, in fact, his album, The Endless Road, was recorded like in one night in a wow. hotel room or something like that. Wow. But anyway, yeah, it's just interesting. You know, she was saying, you know, his, he, when he starts something, he is the band and he right. knows it. You know, he's, he's there, he's on, there's no falling off track, you know? Yeah. He's very honed into what he wants in his vision. Yeah, exactly. It's it's kind of like how um, the only thing I could probably compare it to is um, how a lot of builders or artists artists when they're in their zone or what was it called? No, flow. You know. Yeah. Probably like that for him. You know, there's there's it, everything else is tuned out except the hands and the instrument. You know, so I guess there's still in terms of in the, on the recording side. There's probably some things they must try different microphones and have him use different guitars and in different rooms. There's still a lot of things that you could probably stand yeah. to do multiple takes. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, Kim has mentioned they've done all sorts of mic setups. He's always wanted to do the the AER amp signal in, and I think maybe they did it a couple of times, but she always wanted to do just strictly mic, and that's really what she does. Um, I don't think that. I mean, I've never heard any re acoustic recordings that are straight acoustic like straight mic that sound as good as kim's recordings i think she really is like at the top of the solo finger style uh recording shelf uh but i mean it's like if you listen to any of stephen bennett or tommy's um records you'll you put some headphones on it's almost like you're in the guitar it's just so pleasing you know you hear all the resonance and she has the like the right amount of compression on everything i mean she's just a pro you know plain and simple yeah well you've been you recorded your you've been recording at what master sound studios somewhere yeah, here? Bosch, yeah okay and um so you're gonna put out a new album um and you said that's all instrumental yeah um the first two that i did were at rob's um the first one was full production with multi-instruments and um sort of a singer songwriter contemporary folk record um with a couple finger style things on it, but the second one I did was strictly solo acoustic, just in front of a couple nice microphones. And um, this third one I'm doing is instrumental completely. It's 10 tracks of my own originals, and I, I wanted to do it right. So um, me and Kim dug in and did that, got that knocked out three weeks ago. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. When mm -hmm. are you looking to release that? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking March. Uh, I, I was hoping for January, but logistically speaking i don't want to rush anything right uh, there's a guy in the uk who's done a lot of the graphics designs for a lot of the candy rat and fret monkey artists which are mm. those two record labels are sort of at the forefront of solo acoustic music um modern finger style whatever right and um this guy's booked out he's he's sort of he's, he's really in demand and um so it's kind of a matter of i don't want to rush him you know never rush an artist basically so right right yeah. Uh, I just want to take my time with that. I'll probably release a single though of one of the songs. The album is going to be called Woodscapes. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, really, really looking forward to it just because it's something I've always wanted to do is something purely instrumental, you know? Yeah. How long have you been writing these tunes? Um, let me see. Uh, I actually had the list right here. So a lot of them aren't even three years old. Most of them are three years old. Um, I've been dabbling in solo acoustic music since i was 17 or so so like 2010 or 2011. Mm -hmm. um, i first heard annie mckee around that time uh <laughs> and that really changed what i thought was possible you know um i think it changed and, for a lot of people honestly yes <laughs> yes yeah. yeah, right around when he came around um that whole um, percussive and tapping and it, that really never 
existed on a popular front before exactly. Andy came out. Uh, yeah. he, he definitely changed the landscape. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, yeah. also, it also came about at a time when I feel like YouTube was gaining popularity and he was able yeah. to put out that um, like drifting. Yeah. It was, it just went viral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I still come back to those videos. They're a really big uh, source of inspiration for me. The first one I saw was him playing the harp guitar, mm. and um, yeah, that just you know blew my mind. Changed a lot of things for me. And so I've I've been playing that style. I've learned a lot of um, full songs from him, Tommy Emanuel, um, you know, a couple other of the greats, and in the process of learning their tunes and learning how they choose melodies and chord structure and voicings and accents and you know stuff like that um it, it took me a long time before i even decided okay i'm ready to write my own stuff that i'm going to be proud to stand behind you know right because right. i wrote a lot of things that just sounded like noise for a while <laughs> so uh you know it's it's fun to actually know that what i'm putting out now i'm probably not going to really change or be finicky about i'm just going to keep playing them the way they are and if they evolve on stage then they do if not they don't you know yeah um but yeah, seeing um, Andy McKee at that point, um, I'd been playing electric a lot. And in fact, I was, so that, that winter I broke my arm, at, but I found out that I, if I laid back, I could play, you know, okay. <laughs> I had an arm in a cast, but I could lay back and play acoustic guitar. And uh, <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is chill. Um, and I basically just, played that kind of music for years and years and then i decided to start singing and gigging you know around the area you decided to start singing because you're yeah. i mean for everybody out there that hasn't heard dustin he's got an incredible voice you could oh, be was... you could just front a band with your voice yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, man. that's that's really kind of you um my voice has changed a lot um in fact i can look back at videos from three or four years ago and my voice is completely different um and i don't know if that was because Early on, I sort of molded my voice around who I was influenced by, like John Mayer or Dave Matthews or Jack Johnson or whoever the big pop acoustic guys were at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but now I think my voice is really my own. As of the last two years, it, I listen to recordings. It hasn't changed at all. Um, I'm kind of just finally settled. So, um, But initially, <laughs> when I did first start singing around that time that I saw those Andy McKee videos and wanted to do the solo acoustic thing full on uh my voice was very froggy <laughs> kind of like it is today <laughs> i'm still recovering from last night yeah yeah i'll have to I, i've never heard any of that so it's hard to imagine exactly so for for a timeline when did when did you first start getting into um music or guitar or or and how did that progress into because you said you started with electric yeah yeah i was 11 and my brother gave me his ibanez okay and my dad was really paramount in um getting music good music in front of me my dad um was really into blues um i had stevie ray vaughn and carlos santana playing in my household like my whole childhood okay so, um that's kind of deeply embedded as well um you know i've never really turn my cheek from electric or where my roots are like right you know, but i've um nowadays i just i feel like i as a soloist i can um achieve more with just one acoustic guitar but so i played from like 11 until 16 was purely electric and then around 16 i just didn't play at all because i was skateboarding a lot and being being stupid you know <laughs> <laughs> that's how you broke your arm yeah yeah wow. i broke it on well, see, it actually ended up being a good thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And skateboarding is an expensive hobby. I mean, potentially anything is an expensive hobby, too. Um, but compared right. to buying $1,000 guitars and <laughs> all this equipment and microphones and amps. Yeah, actually, yeah, you make a good point. But at the time, yeah, um, I was blowing whole paychecks on just wheels and deck. Mm -hmm trucks and stuff for my skateboards. But anyway, yeah, so I broke my arm and I was like, okay, this is if something if i broke a wrist or if i broke you know or hyper extended a finger okay now i can't play guitar so that's too i was like no i'm just not gonna skate well i skate for enjoyment now but not anything crazy um so you know after that i 
got an acoustic guitar for Christmas around that time. It was like 17 or 18. And um, I met a guy who was a photographer, a local photographer. And he was like, yeah, come to this open mic. And, you know, there's just, it's funny. It's like the navigation that happens from going to your first open mic to getting full time to hopefully touring, which is my goal. Um, it's it's just funny the way it works. It's it's a constant up and up and up. As long as you're focused on constantly improving and building connections with other people and networking, right? It's a, it's a long ladder. So since eighteen, I'm twenty five now. I'm still navigating. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So that's pretty much that story in a nutshell. I don't want to lull on too long about that because <laughs> talk about guitar too. You know? Yeah. So um, yeah. That's that's that. <laughs> So one thing that I've been really interested in, and I even saw you do, like when I came to see you play, is your arrangements of some things, um, like you did Girl from Ipanema. Yeah. And yeah. did you, it's totally cool if you didn't, but did you come up with that arrangement yourself? I'm actually proud to say that I did. <laughs> yeah. So that's, um, that's what bewilders me still at this point. Like I have not figured out how to, like I can do when I play that song, I play it in a very like a jazz solo style kind of way. Uh -huh. So I'm I'm kind of strumming through the chords and hybrid picking, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have that like driving bass line with it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for that tune, I use a thumb pick. Uh, I used to use a thumb pick for pretty much everything now, but I have gel acrylic nails, and for something, I, some things I use the nail uh, depending on the tone that I want, and then for other things. It's, it's the thumb pick, sort of Tommy Manuel, Chet Atkins style. Um, for that tune, I was actually playing with a flautist and a um, harpist, uh, or harp player. I don't even know if harpist is the correct term there. Um, probably sound like a noob, but uh, <laughs> yeah, they were, they were playing, oh, and a piano player, uh, Carl Olson. And um, yeah, yeah they, were, they were all playing this. I was like, what is that? That sounds so familiar. You know, just the melody, you know, I'm sure, you probably remember the first time you heard it the same way I remember the first time I heard Autumn Leaves when I was a kid. Those kind of melodies, you're, it's so familiar because it's just so good, even if even if it's the first time you've heard it. So I asked for the chord chart, and I just straight away uh, arranged. I do it in F. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I actually, that's the original. Yeah, yeah, I want to say. Um, and it works pretty well for guitar. Um, Adam Rafferty, who's a pretty well-known acoustic guy. He's he, awesome. He does, yeah, he's really smooth. So you probably, uh, you know, he he does a lot of jazz and bebop, Motown stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but he does an arrangement where he just capos at the first and plays it in E, which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I do it in F, and um, I, I consulted Larry for a couple things because I know Larry Larry Burwald, who's on the show. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, as you know, he's a really pretty great jazz player, um, like yourself. And him and his band, Little Doors, the jazz trio, they they do that tune as well. And I was like, you know, just asking him about a couple things. But yeah, that arrangement's it's it's pretty cool. It's on YouTube if you ever wanted to look at it again. But so, how did you approach it? This so you've got, um, you know, it's an F, and then it's a two five G minor to C seven back to F. Like, how do you? Are you just trying to get the bass notes? Or are you fretting the whole chords and just kind of? you know, using some sort of finger picking pattern to play some pretty notes between your melody notes? Well, I've, I've truthfully never, I've only heard like maybe two or three guitars do it. Um, I referenced a couple people's versions, like, like I said, Adam Rafferty's, mm -hmm. but, um, I would dare to say that my version is probably unique in that the bass lines aren't really, um, it's hard to explain. I use my thumb for a lot of the bass too. Um, which probably helps in reaching the chord voicings um, and the melodies, but you're just wrapping your thumb over the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the F and the F sharp and sometimes the G, but um, I don't know that the way that I do the bass lines or the bossa nova esque groove is really, you know, what people would say is correct, quote unquote. Um, but it works. It's, it's fun for me because I can still do a slap on the, the two and the four. Um, but uh, I don't always do it in the first position. I'll go up to um, 
Steve voicing up at the, well, I don't know if it's like the 10th fret maybe, or the eighth fret to get that F there. Yeah. 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 The F. Um, so I'll, I'll do, I'll do that for the first pass for the bridge. I go back to first pos- position, which the bridge is just wonderfully. I, I love that song. It's so good. Um, that took me a while to get the hang of, especially the, La, da, da, do, da, 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 da. you know, yeah, that kind of yeah. threw me for a loop the first time, a couple times I heard it. I had to listen to Frank Sinatra sing it a bunch of times just to be like, okay, am I playing the right thing there? Cause you know, <laughs> but anyway, he, uh, Frank is a, a great resource for yeah. getting like a simp, a fairly simple, straight version of the melodies of lots of these old jazz tunes. Right. I mean, you can look on, you can look in the real book is good reference, although it's not always, a hundred percent but um frank is one of my go-to and i think lots of people's go-to guys so, like i just need to hear frank play it and then i can <laughs> listen to the other jazz players because they, they put all these you know fancy they they improvise on the melody and yeah change up the timing and stuff so um yeah frank does a great job nice to keep it simple when you're especially when you're first learning it right yeah and then expand mm-hmm. from there mm-hmm well, uh, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to watch your your YouTube video closely and figure that out. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. Um, yeah, it's just in studio, so it it's not live or anything. To where you, you can watch my left hand the whole time if you needed to. But it's a it's a yeah, it's a fun tune to get under the fingers. You know, even if it's just, just for the heck of it. Yeah, I get really in- like I enjoy that tune, but I really have a good time improvising over that. Mm-hmm. It's a fun. It's a fun chord progression to play over. Yeah, especially the intro. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I mean, I I love the whole thing, but it's just a it's a classic. Sometimes you get. I've got to be careful where I play that because sometimes I feel like people can you know if it's at a bar, like a more of a mm-hmm. beer drinking kind of bar. Yeah, kind of like ah, oh, that's you get a lot of people who have heard it in so many elevators that they actually think it's just elevator music. Yeah, yeah. And they ignore the fact that you know the the history of it and yeah you know i played it last night uh mm-hmm. at the craft house for their big event and had people dancing and whatnot it's, oh that's great it's like I, yeah it's like i said it's 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 a tune where even if people don't know the name they probably know the melody and even if they don't know the melody they assume they've heard it because it's just so good you know <laughs> but anyway yeah so that kind of jazzy stuff. I do a couple tunes like that. Um, Don't know why from Nora Jones is another one. It's not really jazz, jazz influence, you know? Um, yeah, do, uh, I've seen you do that. You've, it's a great arrangement. You've got a, of that too. Yeah. I borrowed from a couple people for that. I just do it in a, you know, mm-hmm. borrow some voicings. Uh, I really like the key of a, you know, getting on the subject of uh, favorite keys and keys that work well for finger style guitar. In standard tuning, A is one of my favorite ones to work around. Obviously, G or E minor. Mm-hmm. Open A, I've written, or not open A, but just open voicings with A major have worked really well for my um, original arrangements, at least. You know, I, I think what a, something that I've kind of gravitated towards in the past couple of years that has helped me, um, I use a lot of uh, cross string melodies. So I'll use open strings blended with fretted notes and let them ring out sort of like a piano or a harp. And those, th- those kind of sounds are really inspiring to me. In fact, uh, and I owe a lot of that to my guitar player and good friend, Matt Thomas. Um, he plays harp guitar extremely well. If you haven't heard him, uh, he's got a bunch of viral videos on YouTube. Um, but he's a great finger style six string player as well. And he's taught me a lot of those open string, uh, licks and rolls like, Chet Atkins style stuff and you know so that that kind of thing has worked really well for the, the key of A obviously E would work too and G if you work hard enough you can find a lot of other things too but also play a lot in dadgad nowadays and open D mm-hmm. uh, those are really well known for having those drones it sounds so great <clears throat> but uh do you feel when you're playing in dadgad especially do you feel like you have the freedom you've learned dad gad to me it feels like i'm learning spanish like it's like completely yeah. different oh absolutely all my yeah. landmarks are completely thrown off and mm-hmm. while i've memorized a few arrangements in dad gad i feel like i'm i can't stray from the arrangements because i just don't 
have my bearing straight. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it so takes this string tunes is tuned down two frets. This one's not. This it's just yeah. And a, a really tricky thing is you know between your your uh, G and your B string, well your G and your A string, all of a sudden it's not. It's a different. It's two frets and you have an open note or you have a drone note instead of you know having your open on the fourth fret, but. Uh, the cool thing to always keep in mind is that your D and your G are still the same. Those can be your your reference point for voicings and stuff. Dadgad's really cool because you can switch between a major and a minor just like that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I haven't. I'm not going to say that I'm um, really fluent in it to where I can improvise in it. You know, but I, I, I've learned a couple of um, cross string scales and stuff like that, and it's really cool to go to uh, minor five as well if you're in the key of d which is really nice that just works really well i learned um one of the first dad gad tunes i learned was cashmere from led zeppelin <laughs> yeah yeah he that, did that in dad gad originally right yeah mm -hmm. okay. and uh so from there I, i've i've written i think at least eight dad gad tunes now that i'm pretty proud of um all of which are Kind of all of them, like I think four or five of them are are in the key of D, and then I do modulate a couple times. But there's some other nice things you can also play in the key of A, and like I said, G minor, um, E minor actually works pretty well too. Um, you get a nice sus, uh, sus chords out of that. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm Pierre Ben Susan. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's he's like the king of dad gad. I mean, he if you watch him play, it's just it's surreal. His name's um, Pierre Ben Susan. Yeah, I think you said I've heard of him, but I, I think he did a podcast with Adam Rafferty. Mm -hmm. But I, I haven't listened to that episode. Yeah, he. I, I think, I think he's French, and I, I want to say that in France they'd probably crucify me for the way I pronounce his last name. I think. <laughs> I, I can't remember how it's really pronounced. Susan or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah. It, well, it's it's really. There's there's a silenced consonant in there somewhere. I can't remember what it is, but anyway, yeah, he's a good reference point if you wanted to learn anything in Dad Gad. Just he's got a couple little small lessons that are actually, you know, they're quick lessons, but they're really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, as well as Tony McManus, he's he's an yes. awesome uh, Celtic. I got to, Celtic guitarist. I got to meet him two months ago. A really cool guy. Um, oh. His technique is just flawless. There's there's some guitar players that are, you know, even though they they tour full time or they're really highly regarded. Um, they're still not what I would call tight, like tight, tight. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those players, you know, he's, you can tell he's got some classical background to where his posture, his relaxation in his right hand, he's just, he's flawless. So he's a really good reference for learning dad guy tuning as well. And he's such a great, I mean, he's an authority in the world of Celtic, finger style guitar right he's pretty much yeah he is the Celtic guitar guy <laughs> yeah, he's, I did a um a true fire course of his and mm -hmm. I really enjoyed his his playing because I have a I, I don't think it has anything to do with my family background I'm being McMurray mm -hmm. but I just the sound of Celtic music is appealing to me and I'm not <laughs> exactly sure how to explain it but I just like the I feel I like it so I I took his course and um, he does some really cool stuff. He does a lot of these um, rolling triplets. He does some cool yeah. finger style techniques that I'd never even seen before. Yeah, I, I've actually, I've never seen a guitarist that does the down, up, or down, up, down with the thumb so well, like the triplets you were just talking about. Yeah. That sort of give that jig or that, you know, rolling celtic feel yes. i'll watch i'll watch his thumbnail and i'm like how are you doing that dude <laughs> <It was laughs> the amount of practice that had to have gone into that you know because it's just one string it's just like and, it's, and it sounds like that too it's almost like he mutes it to where it's not it's it's just a it's a thing in the background you know versus a major part of the song but it's like such a hard freaking thing to do <laughs> yeah he actually does in the course. He does some with uh, these three fingers, with uh, his index, middle, and ring fingers. And oh. he bum dig it He just rolls those three on the on the string. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's it's hard to do. I've got a couple tunes where of his that 
from that course that I play. Mm-hmm. And I like live. I just I just do two eighth notes. <laughs> I can't. It throws me <laughs> off to try to do the triplet. It I end up like botching it half the time. Right. Now, now, do you use our artificial nails at all? No, I don't. Your- I'm just, and maybe that's part of my problem. I'm just using the flesh on the tips of my fingers. Yeah, yeah it helps. It helps immensely. He gets. Um, he does the same thing as me. He has gel acrylic. His are a bit shorter than mine, surprisingly. Um, but uh, yeah, so he's, he has a very classical technique. But if you watch his right hand in any song that he does, it's just so fluid, you know. Um, he's got great tone, too. He knows how to pull certain parts of the song. I'll watch where he places his right hand. That's also a really important thing for finger style is um, if you're playing something really busy or chucky, you never want to play closer to the sound hole like a classical player would do. Okay. Um, I don't want to be closer to the bridge and sort of drive that energy to the top. It just, it makes things a little bit easier. Um, I know for me, if I'm doing a, a Tommy Manuel or Merle Travis style song with the thumb pick, I, I, I would never go play with my right hand over the sound hole. It's always closer to the bridge. So you get a tighter attack. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but Tony, he'll be, he'll be all over the place. I mean, he does something slower and he wants to milk the melody, he'll move his hand closer to the sound hole. And at that point, you're getting less of a tight string sound and more of a warm, blooming note, you know, and it takes years, decades to get that sort of translation with yeah. your instrument. And, you know, he does it so well. It's mm-hmm. really inspiring. And on an acoustic, when you're not able to just switch pickups, it's it's that much more important to... That's another cool thing about Tony is that for his live shows, unlike a lot of fingerstyle players like Tommy and Andy McKee, Don Ross, he actually, I think he has a K&K Trinity installed in his guitar. Um, Is but, that a, a microphone? Yeah, it's a microphone and um, under saddle transducer pickup combination. But I think he, for the most part at his live shows, he just mics his guitars. And he just puts his right foot up on a footstool like a classical player would. Right. And he just doesn't move. So the microphone doesn't, you know, uh, get out of focus or whatever, but he's he's a very surgically accurate guitar player. It's really inspiring to watch if you're into that style of music, you know. Yeah, the Tony McManus, he's he's a great one. And uh, so regarding the nails, we actually had a <laughs> classical guitarist on um, a few weeks ago. His name is <laughs> Nick Lee. And mm-hmm. uh, so, if you're in, interested in classical guitar, any of our listeners out there, check out that episode. Um, but we, he, he was really funny about his nails. We, uh, you know, he had the story about breaking a nail the night, night before gig. And oh my God. Um, do you, so you were actually, you go to a nail salon to get these gel acrylic na- nails put on. Yes. And, um, I first started doing that about four years ago. Um, when I met Matt Thomas, that was my first time meeting a really, really, good guitar player <laughs> mm-hmm. not uh, sorry a really good acoustic guitar player um in this genre of contemporary modern fingerstyle guitar um and when i met him shook his hand i was like yeah i'm a big fan of uh you know you and your style of music or whatever I, i've been playing fingerstyle guitar myself too and uh he just looked at me and they looked down at my hand he said where's your nails <laughs> so um i went and got some put on uh, it's like nine bucks. Well, actually, no, it's twelve. And then every every time you get a fill, it's nine bucks. Uh, at least at the place I go to, I've been going to the same place. Um, but it's really worth it. Uh, and the reason I say that it's worth it is because I know that a lot of classical players do prefer the natural nail, and that would make sense because the strings on classical are a bit warmer in character. Um, so you can get away with having a thinner attack. It kind of rounds it out, and it's probably a lot more articulate. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never even tried. To grow out my natural nail and strengthen it with like the supplements or whatever the keratin or whatever it's called because at my gigs if i'm strumming or if i'm doing forward rolls or triplets of any sort anything percussive the tension of a steel string it just it's just going to rip your nail no matter how strong naturally it is so right uh, for me getting these put on every three or four weeks is so worth it because i know i know they'll last you know so Makes so, sense. I, so I have not gone that route. <laughs> and the, the, the I'm I mean I've started to get pretty good calluses on my my right hand. Yeah, fretting or my my picking fingers. 
mm-hmm. not as not as thick as my fretting fingers on my left hand. Mm-hmm. But I, I asked the same question to Nick, but he because he only uses his nails for the most part. Yeah, and I guess he, it's a combination of the flesh and the nail. But yeah, on a classical guitar, he doesn't have this problem. But what happens to me is they'll get the the calluses will actually build up, and then they'll start to fall off, and then I get this piece that will actually catch the string oh. and there's like this terrible day where i'm like <laughs> nothing feels right and then i end up like keep like trying to scratch it down and yeah and then i have it's like i'm back at the beginning i have to like i lost my callus and so now i gotta yeah well here's a build here, back up oh gosh i've never even considered that well here's a funny thing two things somebody had told me i can't remember who um actually it might have just been matt um he told me that tommy emmanuel when he would take a shower, he would wear gloves okay, to preserve his calluses. And, uh, you know, a lot of Tommy doesn't use artificial nails. He never has, uh, with that sort of touring schedule, you'd literally probably have to pay somebody to like come along and be your nail lady or something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Or nail guy the requirement of your sound tech. You also have to take this <laughs> class on nails. Yep. Yep. Um, so, but you know, Tommy's tone is just so fat and punchy and, um, Who's another guy that, I mean, um, Lawrence Juber, the same thing. He doesn't use um, artificial nails either. It's just from playing so long, his right hand has really nice calluses too that just give him a really beefy tone. Um, me, I could never do that um, just because I wash my hands like several times a day and, you know, they'll mm-hmm. fall off. I could, I've never considered that, you know, they would catch and make the string attack sound bad because a lot of... Uh, a lot of guys that have the artificial nails will tell you um, if you don't carry around a nail buffer, you're, <laughs> you're, you know, it's, it's a recipe for disaster because if you get so much as like a little, uh, Oh, a little sharp. Like, bit. Yeah. If you get a little burr, it, especially if it's in your ring finger, that would just suck because that's sort of your melody finger. Um, I keep a, I keep like three nail files on me usually, um, you know, getting de- decreasing grit to where it's basically like uh, by the time I get to the last one, it's perfectly smooth. It's like glass and the trebles will be nice and fat and sweet. Um, but if you don't, I mean, usually after a three or four hour gig, my nails will kind of be in a shit, you know, <laughs> wow. and they, they won't be in really great condition because I've played the hell out of them. Um, right. right. But, uh, what's the other thing I was going to say? Oh, uh, I would, I would caution though. Um, if anybody, wanted to invest in the artificial nails. Um, if you've been finger picking and gotten fairly decent with just the flesh and you've gotten your callus to, you know, a moderate, or you don't even really need callus per se, it just helps. But if you've practiced and gotten good just with the, the regular flesh of your, your finger, if you get nails and then you're like, oh my God, these are amazing, which I was the first time I got them. I was like, oh, these are the bee's knees. Um, if you take them off and then want to go back to playing with flesh, it's like starting over because your muscle memory is completely different, like completely different. And that's what happened to me the first time I took them off. And I was like, I was like, okay, I'll just get them put on whenever before I have a show or something. It was like starting over because when you play with your finger, with your, just the flesh of your fingers, you're, you're sort of used to plucking and feeling the string before uh, the initial attack. I guess. And when you have your nail, it's so quick and it's just a different, your knuckles, I feel like on your right hand, just get used to the placement and the muscle memory, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't like starting over. So (laughs) just, you know, you should be prepared for that. If, if you do get the nails and you really like them, you kind of have to commit to them unless you want to start over from scratch. It's a scary thing, but it's true. It's what happened to me. (laughs) I feel like my wife is not, not going to be into this idea. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, probably not. (laughs) Uh, But I do. uh, So I have uh, dishwashing gloves. I have those like, they look like cleaning gloves that the cleaning ladies or cleaning people use. But yeah, yeah. like I I don't mind doing dishes, but (laughs) if I don't have gloves, like for family, like Thanksgiving, I brought my gloves down because I'm like, I want to (laughs) help. I can't do like, you know, 30 minutes of dishes because it will like on my fretting hand it'll mess me up. Yeah. oh my that's hilarious yeah it's, a, it's like a great four dollar investment 
I've yeah. never gone to the route of having to wear something in the shower, though. That's a whole nother. <laughs> yeah. And you got to wash your hands eventually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. It just, I, I think maybe soaking them for that long, even if it's more than like a minute, I guess, freaks out some guitar players. You know, there's another guy, Gareth Pearson, I think I had heard, did the same thing. Who's, who's that? He's, he's a really great guitar player, too, sort of in the same vein as Tommy Manuel with the thumb pick and the Chad Atkins, Jerry Reed style stuff. Um, what was his name again? Oh, Gareth Pearson. Gareth Pearson. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that he uh, did the same thing. I mean, that might not be the case now. But that's just what I heard through the grapevine. Oh, that's funny yeah. stuff. Well, so, you know, we're working our way through all these aspects of, of fingerstyle guitar. I guess my next big question for you, and I'm sure lots of people are interested in, is um, about your actual guitars. Mm -hmm. um, you are... A, a Larave guitar guy, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got what was the other? You've got another very nice guitar. Yeah, um, Larave is the company that I've been endorsed by for about two years now. Okay, uh, they're far and away the best um, factory built guitars that I've ever played. I've played, you know, I, I had Martins for a while. Played plenty of Gibsons and Taylors, and you know, the big, those are the big three, obviously. Um, like Takaminis, you name it. Um, I've always been somebody who's really particular about their gear. It's just, it's a funny thing. A side note, when I was skateboarding, I was really into shoe design just because, you know, they put a lot of tech into how the shoe performs with the skateboard, how it, you know, the comfort factor, what it does for the functionality's purpose, like slim versus bulky or whatever. So I've always been into like the technical side of things. So naturally the same way with guitars. Um, Larave, John Larave himself, um, he's from Canada. He started building guitars in the seventies. He sort of got put on the map by, I believe it was Bruce Coburn, Coburn, um, really popular Canadian folk artist. Um, he was playing his guitars and John had this idea to basically turn the flat top acoustic guitar world on its head by bracing the steel string guitar like a classical. So there's a little bit heavier bracing than your average Martin scalped bracing. Um, what that does is it tames the bass and lets the mid range and the trebles be a little fatter. So for me, um, you can still flat pick and strum the heck out of them. Um, but when you finger pick a layer of a, it's, you'll notice the balance is a lot different than a Taylor or a Martin. It's just full across the spectrum. And I also like that their standard fretboard radius is closer to a classical. It's a little bit flatter. So um, mm -hmm. it's not sort of doesn't have a hump in it like a Gibson or a Martin. All right. All right. So for me, um, Larvae's have been really nice. I, I, I bought and sold probably like between six and 10 before I decided, okay, I should just get a custom. Um, my custom one is it's an Italian spruce topped. Um, Madagascar Rosewood L body, which is their signature model that put them on the map. It's basically a dreadnought uh, classical hybrid. Um, so it's cool. It's a really cool guitar. It sounds great plugged in. Like I said, because it's balanced, it's not overly boomy, like a say like a bluegrass Martin Dread or a Gibson J forty five. It's different. It doesn't sound traditional like what you would hear Bob Dylan playing. <laughs> um, so it's not what I would recommend for somebody who's into Americana or country, it's more of a modern, uh, I don't know, I guess if I had to compare it to cars, um, if Martin was a Mustang and Gibson was a Chevy, Larave would probably be like, I don't know. Like a Tesla, like a Tesla or something? Or something. <laughs> like, like maybe like an Audi or something. Okay. Okay. I, don't, I, don't know. I mean, that's probably a poor comparison because they're British, but uh, you, you get what I'm saying. It's just different flavors. It's more modern. It's more, for the player and I don't know. Um, now Larave um, in his shop in the seventies and eighties before he went full scale and shifted from hand built to, you know, small shop factory stuff. He, uh, he influenced a lot of Canadian luthiers and really, in my opinion, the, the best guitar builders in the world are from Canada. Most of them. Um, and a lot of luthiers will agree with that. In fact, I went to the Woodstock, guitar show in New York about two months ago. And a lot of the best and highlighted luthiers are 
from Canada. Uh, and a lot of them are actually influenced by John Larabay. In fact, a couple of the ones that, you know, deal guitars that are above the $10,000 range were actually apprentices to John Larabay. So his influence, he's sort of like the Martin of Canada, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and the people that apprenticed with him now are the most sought after luthiers, some of the most sought after luthiers in the world. And among those is um, Mark Benito. Mark Benito built his first guitars almost like Larabay copies. Um, another cool thing that Larabay was doing at that time was they chose to start doing wood bindings instead of like, um, what is that stuff, Ivoroid, you know, the plastic or whatever that Martin would use. Uh, they did all wood bindings. They do like a little mosaic rosette, like a classical. So the guitars just had a really unique look to them. And Mark Benito was sort of um, building in that style. He eventually evolved and started doing his own things. And I've been working with him for about two years now. Um, and his guitars for me are the best I've played, especially for their price point. You know, they're, they're solo luthier built instruments. They're actually built in his basement at his house in Ontario. <clears throat> and he's kind of, he's like, he has a really nice balance of old world craftsmanship and modern. Uh, a lot of builders now that are charging in the 10,000 range, they're strictly modern. They don't, they do everything by machinery or well, most, most by machinery and, uh, you know, laser saws and stuff like that. Mark will actually process all of his own wood. Like he'll harvest the wood. Um, He'll split split the billets. He'll do everything himself. Basically, make everything except like the tuning machines and, and the fret wire. It's pretty. It's pretty cool. He has a shop tour on YouTube. If you type in Benito Guitars, uh, B E N E T E A U. That's how you spell his name. Um, he has a really cool like ten minute video of his shop and a couple really nice guitars that are just hanging out there. Uh, but yeah, he's a fantastic luthier. He's a really nice guy to boot. Um, so I. I have a Martin uh, Aura. It's an OMC Aura. I don't know if you can see it there. Mm -hmm. I've had it for a while. I got it back when I was working a, a real job and had the money to buy those sorts of things. I've decided decided that I don't think that's the guitar for me. So I've gotten very interested in in these other guitars. And so these the Larivés. How and you don't have to tell us much yours specifically was, but what's the entry level? price point or kind of the range of prices that, on a Larave and a Benito guitar. Yeah, that's that's another great thing about Larave is um their prices are really reasonable. Uh for a while their factory was only in uh Vancouver in Canada. Um now I think they were doing their satin finished guitars in Canada and then they're doing all their high end stuff in California that anything that needed the high gloss or whatever it was. Um, and Rosewood uh, basically is, the past couple of years has been a chore to import across borders because of CITES laws, you know, uh, regulating, making sure that, it, you know, uh, vulnerable woods and tree, tree species aren't over harvested. So Rosewood has always been a thing because not so much in the wide spectrum for Music musical makers don't really put a dent in it. It's, it's really the furniture market mm -hmm. that kind of is screwed over. But as a result, uh, guitar builders have a headache getting rosewood or certain woods across borders. So Larve moved most everything to California, and because of that, their rate has gone down quite a bit. Um, they have a couple different series. They have the the O three, the O five, and the O nine, and then the ten. So basically the O3 is all satin. The the point though is that they're all solid woods. There's never laminates used. They're not they're kind of in between a small shop and a large scale factory like Martin. So if you've heard of like Callings or Loudon, yeah. those that's a small shop operation, really high quality, lots of quality control. As a result, usually a higher price. Um, then you have Martin, which obviously is like, you know. It's a factory, like a full-blown factory. So Larabay sits in between that. Um, they're run by a family. In fact, uh, Johnny Larabay, John Larabay's son, was the guy I worked with for the custom model. Um, Matt also has a custom model from Larabay as well. He liked, liked their guitars a lot, and he got his own. But anyway, the point is the 03 series usually is between like 800 and 1300. 
Oh, okay. Not really crazy in the grand spectrum because a lot of Martins that are Martins fully solid wood. Um, and gosh, I really hope Chris Martin isn't listening to this. But, uh, they're, <laughs> I hope he is. <laughs> they're, they're, they're full wood models, you know. And for people listening to this that don't know, usually the more solid wood is used, the more resonant a guitar is. It's just plain and simple. It's just physics. Um, their first like full wood model, I think, starts between like fourteen or yeah, fourteen hundred and up. So um, that being said, Larvae is you know they don't use any laminates for any of their woods. Um, their neck profile is something I forgot to highlight on. Their standard neck profile is really nice. It's a sort of medium C, not as thin as a Taylor, not as bulky as a Martin. Um, I found it really comfortable. I love gigging with it. So, um, so that's sort of where Larvae sits. They're really fair priced. Now, mine, my particular Larvae is a 09 series, and that's the series I've always liked most. Um, those start around, I mean, you can get them used between like 1300 and two grand. Um, mine's approximate worth is about 3500 I think, because of the wood used. Right. But um, there was a, you know, they cut me a deal because of the endorsement. Um, Matt has a 10 series. The, ten, the difference between the 9 and the 10 series is just the amount of shell inlay that goes into it and the quality of the woods. So um, 10 series is sort of like Martin's uh, 42 or 45 series with all the abalone throughout, you know, and they use better woods. But the 9 series has been good for me because it's gloss and I sweat a lot on stage and, you know, it just it's going to hold up better over time. Now, Benito, his base price as of right now, I think is uh, 5500 and it goes up with tone woods and bevels and stuff. But he, there's a lot factored into his price. His wait time is about 8 to 12 months. Um, but for his, for his guitars, um, I, played a, I played at least two dozen really, really nice guitars at Woodstock that were about twice the price of his. Um, and they didn't sound like that. Like they sounded about as good as his, maybe a little better because they're just maybe slightly better or more renowned luthiers. But point is that for what the price that he asks, it's, it's extremely fair for the craftsmanship and he's been building also for almost 40 years too. So that's something to take into account. There's a lot of younger luthiers that are building nice guitars, but you don't really know if their guitars are going to hold up structurally like you do from a master luthier like Mark or John Larvae. So right. there's that to take into account too. He's reputable. In fact, I first heard of Benito guitars from Don Ross, who is one of the guys that influenced Amy McKee and so many other artists. In fact, Don Ross is the, the guy at the forefront of the Candy Rat Records label. So he's been playing Benito's for a long time as well. Don Ross. I feel like I've heard of him. Yeah, he's really bluesy. Yeah, he's very. Um, Wait. He, yeah, I have seen a, a video of him play at some point. Yeah, lots of jazz influence with his stuff. It's really cool. Um, got to see him live a couple months ago, and really cool, really funny guy. Um, but he does a lot of crazy jazz voicings. I think you'd probably really dig his music. It's pretty interesting. I've never heard anybody else that sounds like him. So, um, but yeah, he's a. Uh, great player and the tone that he pulls out of his Benito is pretty, pretty fantastic as well. They're, they're great guitars in that you can play them really gently like a Loudon or a small body guitar and they respond well. But then if you hit them really hard, they sound just as good. So a lot of times that's not the case. Sometimes you get a guitar that does one or the other better. Um, so. yeah, I noticed uh, a lot of the tailors sound really good finger picked. And then when you strum them hard, they yes. I don't really like the way they break up when they, they're fairly strident, yeah, and um, I've never been a Taylor fan for that reason, their lack of versatility. Um, gosh, I, hope. I love playing. The feeling of playing a Taylor, it's very easy on the fingers. Yeah, yeah I will say that. So, Bob Taylor, if you're listening, I, I do like the neck profile of your guitars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I went to, uh, I tried out a bunch at Guitar Center, and out of what they had at Guitar Center, the Taylors were... My favorite for the finger style kind of stuff. Just yeah, they're, they're very balanced and they're not boomy, so it sounds nice and chimey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it definitely for like, if I was trying to play like, you know, flat picking stuff, it wasn't my my favorite for that. Yeah, 
Yeah, different different guitars for different styles, man. Hundred percent. I've like I said, being a sort of a gear nut my whole life, I've always liked to reach for different guitars, even if they're guitars that I know I'm not necessarily gonna like and just being like, Okay, what what kind of, what, what does this guitar do well? You know? Yeah. What is this guitar meant for? And um if it's a really great guitar, it can do a lot of things really well. And in my experience, um, now this is going to sound like a Larive commercial, um, but Larive and Benito's have been good for a variety of styles. They can handle flat picking. They can handle dad gad tuning stuff. They can handle jazz, blues, a hard strum. You know, it's just it's it's a really great feeling having an instrument that responds to where you want to take it. You know, so yeah. When you're a gigging musician, it's incredibly important to be able to be on stage and not have to you know switch instruments every few songs yeah I and mean, that's why i use the es335 because of its versatility oh yeah, like, yeah it's not necessarily the best jazz tone and it's not necessarily the best you know twangy country tone or mm-hmm. lead tone, but it's it sounds really good for like everything, everything. Yeah. yeah so mm-hmm. it's in terms of versatility it's my my number one choice like that or another semi-hollow kind of guitar so i understand the need for versatility yeah yeah um so you're running from your guitar are you running into a preamp yeah let's talk before you run to your pa yeah um pickups are super 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 important if you are doing finger style music in a live setting Um, The reason I say this is I went through, again, going back to the gear thing, um, I went through so many different kinds of pickups, and I'm not going to bash any brands like I've done previously about guitars. (laughs) Um, But I will say that K&K Trinity, the K&K Trinity has worked very, very well for me. I first heard um, Andy McKee and Don Ross were using that, and they're fairly percussive contemporary finger style guitar players and um so the idea behind these pickups um Dieter from K&K Sound in Oregon um basically his main pickup is a K&K Pure that's the fun foundation of the sound it's three little sensors that go under the bridge there's no drilling involved um they pick up the resonance of the guitar first and foremost um a lot of under saddle piezos they sort of pick up the string energy and in that they can sometimes sound quacky or they can sound a little too brash because they're picking up what's underneath a piece of bone. Um, now magnetics, they suffer from sounding a little plasticky, um, because of where they're sat in the sound hole, they're sat at that place. Like I said, where if you're playing really hard or fast, like you don't want to be picking there because the sound is just too mid rangey and warm. So magnetic is normally going to sound like that. Um, K and K had this idea to blend their pure mini, which is the under saddle um, transducers with a microphone microphone is just a little silver bullet. Uh, you point at the strings or really you could point it anywhere. From but underneath. It's, yeah. It, it's a little, uh, wire that it's flexible. You can kind of point it wherever you want. Um, I tend to point it at the treble strings. Um, And so you have two sources at that point. Um, You only have one, it's only one cable. You use a TRS stereo cable. And that is sent to um, the third part of the Trinity, which is the preamp. Now the preamp um, allows you to mix the signals separately. So for me, what I've done is I pretty much take all the bass and the the mids out of the microphone. the reason I do that is to avoid feedback. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people sometimes will get the Trinity and be like, oh, this pickup sucks. It's like, no, you just don't really know how to EQ it properly. So the preamp is just this little box. It's sort of meant to be, you know, you set it and forget it. Uh, it's a little screwdriver in there. And it has a little plate that goes over it. You can adjust the gain of the microphone or the pickup. For the pickup, I scoop out a little bit of the mids because it's just a warm sounding pickup. Um, scoop out some of the mids, boost the trebles a bit for clarity. And then after that's set to where like, I'll, I'll start with my mixer flat and get an idea. How, how can I get the pickup to sound its best with just the preamp? Um, you know, a controlled setting, no feedback, you know, 
nice and articulate across the board, uh, no dead notes. After that's finished, I can send it to a board, add reverb, do whatever I need to do. Um, maybe take out some mids if the room is still boomy or do whatever. Um, but once you get a feel for how to mix it properly, um, you won't really run into any feedback issues. Um, I use a feedback buster occasionally, the little rubber disc that goes in the sound hole. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so that's that's pretty much what I do for a majority of my gigs. Uh, all my guitars have the K and K Trinity in it. I've been endorsed by them for a while and really just love their pickups. There's some other um, brands out there like Pick Up the World and um, probably a couple other I can't think of that are doing the same general thing, but uh, K and K has just been really reliable for me. And Larry uh, is a dealer for them as well at Music Go Around. Um, I've sent a lot of people his way. They're like, "Oh my God, what do you have in your guitar?" You know, it sounds really great. So, um, so, so without that, an actual mic, like if you just have, you know, the what comes in a acoustic electric Taylor yeah. or Martin from the store, yeah, you're gonna have just like under saddled pickups, right? Yeah, pretty and much. You're, so your percussion isn't going to resonate. It's not gonna come no. through as much, right? Yeah, no, not at all. And um. Really, the, the pure mini on its own. Andy McKee, he doesn't. He used to use the Trinity. He doesn't anymore. Um, I talked to him last time I saw him, and he just uses the K and K pure mini and notches out some mids with his preamp. Um, he doesn't have the microphone. The the cool thing about the preamp is that it picks up percussion as well. It's a body trans under. It's a body soundboard transducer. So if you tap on the bridge, you get a nice thump through the sub. You can if you even do triplet accents with your left hand on the fretboard like a ticket you know sort of like that you can hear the left hand it's it's incredible um if you do any sort of percussion on the sides like if you smack the side near the end pin which he does on a couple of his tunes you can hear that loud and clear and it sounds thick and woody it's just it's really nice hmm. you add a microphone and now you have all the brilliance of the trebles and you get the sound if it's eq'd correctly and the sound guy knows what he's doing and the pa isn't shit um It'll sound like you're in the guitar. It's wonderful. Um, and a lot of people are doing the K and K Trinity in combination with the magnetic for effects. The magnetic um, that K and K makes is sort of a different magnetic than most. Like, like I said, I'm going to try not to name other brands, um, but their magnetic is also passive, like the K and K Pure Mini. And so it picks up a lot of the natural elements as well. For some people, it's it takes getting used to because, it, like I said, I use under saddles for a while, and they're so hot, like you know, they're so sensitive at first that you get used to that responsiveness. With a K and K, it's like it's just like playing the guitar. So you kind of have to dig in. It's I don't recommend it for people that play in front of a band because you're going to feel like you have to beat your guitar up um, to cut through the mix. Um, that's not to say you can't pre-gain it properly and still have it stand in front of the band, but if you're just strumming co open chords, like, you know, right. at that point, it doesn't matter too much what you have in your guitar as long as it's mixed well from the board, but for the Trinity, it sounds extremely natural. Um, as long as you EQ it correctly, take out some of the mids so it doesn't sound a little overly warm, you know? Um, but uh, I've, I've really enjoyed the sound I've gotten through it, especially when I have a sub. When you have a sub involved, it really brings out the the mass of the guitar. Like people are like, oh my God, your guitar sounds so like full and just punchy. And it's because the, the transducers under the bridge are picking up every bit of energy that I'm putting into it with my hands. So I know you told me not to talk with my hands, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Um, how much does that, does that cost that... Uh... K and K Trinity. Yeah, so the Pure Mini is, as far as I know, it's always been like ninety nine bucks. Um, oh, wow! And then getting it installed, how much is that? Yeah, generally, I don't want to quote Larry's prices because it might change over time, but it's usually between like thirty and sixty bucks to have a pickup put in. Um, so overall, this isn't a huge investment compared to the cost of a guitar. No, no, and it's it's a really good investment if you you know, sort of value the quality of the natural sound. Um, like I said, if you're just playing with a band and you're playing in really noisy places, like any under saddle piezo will do or a magnetic, um, a lot of bluegrass guys like magnetics because they don't worry about feedback and they 
they just want to cut through the mix. They don't care if it sounds acoustic. Mm -hmm. um, but for solo acoustic and listening rooms, the Trinity just sounds really, um, what's the word, uh, true to the guitar. Because what's cool is they call it a pure, uh, I think a natural pure mini or something like that is the official name of the product. But so, you know, I told you I have it in like three or four of my guitars. If I bring two guitars, for instance, to like a house show or a listening room of some sort, you'll know when I switch guitars, even if they're mixed and EQ'd pretty similarly, because the pickup itself is actually picking up the natural characteristics of each guitar. Like for instance, one of my Benetos is Alpine Spruce and Walnut, and then my Larave is Alpine Spruce and Rosewood. If you listen to me play either of them one after the other, you'll be like, oh wow, the Rosewood one is really shimmery and it sounds like a Larrabe. You listen to the Bento, oh, that sounds, it's got walnut back and sides. It sounds more midi and more woody sounding, you know, like less of a shimmery ethereal guitar like the Larrabe. So you can tell, you know, you can actually appreciate your guitar through the PA, which if you put a magnetic or a under saddle piezo in your guitar, it's just gonna sound like a plugged in guitar. It's not gonna sound it's unfortunate, but it robs all the natural qualities of your instrument that you spend that kind of money on. So it's nice that there's a pickup that actually will be like, oh yeah, here's the guitar. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> it's hard to put it any other way, but I think that's the reason a lot of um, really well-known luthiers, like for instance, Michael Greenfield and um, a lot of the guys at Dream Guitars, they recommend the Pure Mini in those sort of instruments. So yeah, I can talk about this for a really long time. So. And that is where we're going to end part one of today's episode. Join us next week for part two as we continue the conversation with Dustin Furlow. Thank you guys once again for listening to Fret Buzz the podcast. We really do appreciate it. If you like what you hear, head on over to iTunes and give us a review. Um, and yeah, stop on by fretbuzzthepodcast.com. Check it out and let us know what you think. And we'll see you guys next Thursday for part two with Dustin Furlow on Fret Buzz the Podcast.